Hello, Patrick. Hello, Adam. How are you this week? I'm fantastic. How are you? I'm great. Shall we greet our audience as well? Hello, everyone. Welcome Probably. to Lost in Criteria. I am Adam. This is my friend. John Patrick Owatari Dorgan. He hyphenates his last name, that crazy liberal. Mm-hmm. This week we're talking about, uh, well, it's a, it's kind of a change of pace for our for our series so far, which is one reason that we wanted to do the Criterion Collection, is that we have these sorts of odd little odd little toss-ins. Because <laughs> um, we've, <laughs> yeah, we've just been... like out of left field. Yeah, we've been, we've, been, we've been talking about a lot of classics of world cinema. Um, we haven't done an American film yet, I don't think. And our first American film on the list, Spine Order, is number 12. This is Spinal Tap, uh, directed by Rob Reiner. It is uh, not the not the first mockumentary, not the first musical mockumentary even, but certainly the uh, codifier and the classics. Uh, 1984, written by Christopher Guest, Michael McKeon, Harry Shearer, and Rob Reiner. Obviously, the the first three of those, besides Rob, uh, have worked together quite a bit uh, in the mockumentary style sense. But this is what got them started on it. Not their best work, I'd say. I think they really hit their pinnacle with with Best in Show. But... Really, like I, I used to think so. Really, but then I watched this one again because the last time I had watched this was, I guess, with you sometime in let's say high school, probably. And I was definitely in the uh, Best in Show camp. But then I watched it again this time and. It really clicked for me better than it did the last time, and I really, really enjoyed it. I found myself laughing, literally laughing out loud. <laughs> I, I, no, I certainly did laugh out loud at this. I certainly laughed out loud at Best in Show as well. Um, but uh, I, th- I think what ta- it m- might have tainted this viewing for me was that I recently watched Meet the Ruddles. Um, are you familiar mm-hmm. with Meet the Ruddles? I'm, yes, I, you showed I'm, it to I'm me. Quite, I'm quite sure that you would be. Um, yeah, I did show it to you. I if not me, I, I figured your father would have given his obsession with the Beatles, but he may he may just deny the Meet the Ruddles exists. Meet the Ruddles <laughs> Meet the Ruddles is, for those who don't know, uh, an Eric Idol uh, written and well co written and a uh, Lauren Michaels produced nineteen seventy eight um, mockumentary uh, about a Beatles. Well, they're they're sort of a parody of the Beatles, not a, not in that they're a Beatles parody band, but it is a a fake history. Of a band like the Beatles, right? Called it's sort the of Ruddles. a parallel universe yeah, sort of thing. Yeah, and it is by all means a mockumentary, but this is—it's a different sort of mockumentary style. That is that is sort of the VH1 behind the music mockumentary. Um, that whereas this is this is the the on the streets rock rock and roll movie that was very popular in the eighties uh, with with hair bands, and it's definitely it's a spot on parody of that sort of thing. But one uh, I do one thing I will mention. I like both movies, Meet the Ruddles and and Spinal Tap, uh, for their music. Who uh, the guys writing the music are spot <laughs> yes, on. Do a, yeah, wonderful for, job. for what they're trying to do. Um, <laughs> and and with this, with Spinal Tap, it's oh, it's, it's ridiculous how 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 great it is. I mean, because the songs, you know, listening to them, they're obviously over the top parodies. Um, but, but the thing is, is that none of them would be that far out of yeah. place on one of these hair metal yeah. albums. The lyrics like, are trite and dumb. If you heard, what is it, like Big Bottom or whatever. Yeah, Fat Bottom Girl. It's, <laughs> it's, I mean, yeah, it's a direct it's, it's parody. It's almost identical, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, yeah. The lyrics are trite and dumb, but they're only a little more trite and a little more dumb than the actual <laughs> lyrics. Like the lyrics. Regular hair metal, and, yeah. And, and the music is is spot on, really quite good, and it's a time where while song crafting was not technically that great, individual instrumentation was usually very good, um, or at least very, very technical. Uh, guitar work and, and drumming. It was It was times where there were lots of solos. Right. Showing off people's abilities, which don't always work cohesively musically, but well, yeah, they they even do a nice parody of that yes. in the uh, yes. <laughs> with, with the violin and the yes, and it, and it it really like they do a very good job of magnifying those 
oh, elements of oh, hair metal absolutely. in that time. And it, the, it, yeah, I, it is, yeah, like you said, spot on. Yeah, that, I mean, and that's, <laughs> that's what good parody does. It takes it takes what it is and, and what what it wants to poke fun at, and and it has to do it lovingly, really. I mean, these these people don't don't hate what they're what they're no, mocking. No, it's obvious that the people involved yeah. are. Yeah, it, it's a not necessarily. I love this thing, but yeah, it's ridiculous. But it's ridiculous. Kind of, it's not just. It's not just ridiculous for ridiculous sake. It's not ridiculous out of a mean spirit. Because you can tell when it's ridiculous out of a mean spirit. And even if these guys aren't huge fans of what they're mocking, they're still not doing it out of a mean spirit in this, certainly. And, and I like, I like that even, even Rob Reiner's character, the director of the, of the movie that plays the director of the, of the documentary, is a sort of, Parody of caricature this, of a this, documentary. The sort of, of the sort of people who make doc- like like in his introduction, he talks about how all of his previous work was co- for commercials. Um, <laughs> this is his first major production, and it's it's a very terribly thought out documentary about a, about a washed up rock band. <laughs> A, a, yeah, rock, a no, rockumentary, if you will. Well, and then, yeah, everything down to, the, like, the, what, USS Cole yeah. hat and the lens around his neck. It's yeah. just all... Oh, yeah. It's, it's... No, he even... Yeah, it's beautiful. I also, but, like, to that point, I think I think this is... It's very poorly done, but I think it's poorly done in the spirit of that character. Uh, after we talk to him, the opening shot of... Because he's sort of introducing the movie. So the opening shot of what we get with the actual movie is their plane landing, and it's very, very, it's it's like an incompetent trying to do triumph of will. Yeah, <laughs> of 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 following yeah, of yeah. Hitler's plane forming across. Yeah, I mean, yeah, obviously a very famous, very famous documentary scene. But but we just have their plane landing because how are we going to afford a second plane to fill that <laughs> to fill and then and then mm-hmm. blah blah blah, but. So yeah, there's there's a lot of little moments too. I guess is what I'm what I'm trying to get into that. Um, I actually at this point, and and I hate to start off on a negative note. I have I have met um, Christopher Guest and Michael McKeon and Harry Shear uh, when they were doing um, what's the name of their band from uh, the the A Mighty Wind. Uh, oh, I, you know, I never saw it. Oh, it's a great movie. You should see it. Um, anyway, they did a tour. Um, as as them, I can't. I'm gonna I'm gonna hate myself for not being able to remember the name of the band. Um, but it's be- gonna go down in infamy because of that. Get letters because of that. I have had a negative personal experience with Christopher Guest. I'm sorry to hear that. Yeah. Um, it was a it was a weird weekend. Um, it happened that they were in town for their thing. Uh, the same weekend as uh, Motley Crue was playing at a con- a festival called Rock on the Range, it takes place at uh, the local hockey or not hockey uh, soccer stadium, the Columbus Crew Stadium. Um, so Motley Crue, by the way, incredibly old. Um, in fact, this movie Ooh, yeah they this, would have to be. this movie could have been made about Motley Crue uh, two years ago when this happened. Um, <laughs> Because, except they're not quite as washed up as Final Tap is meant to be, but uh, but Nikki Six uh, ordered. I was the only person. I work at a hotel. There's a background information for the general public, um, and I do room service. I do baggage handling. I do assorted other underling sort of work. And now you're probably going to be fired. Uh, I can't talk about this on social media, but technically, this isn't social media. Right, nobody's uh, listening. Yes, exactly. Uh, and certainly anyway, not responding. Anyway, Motley Crue was there, uh, and Nikki Six, uh, who who is not the oldest member of Motley Crue, but perhaps in mentally, uh, he ordered oatmeal for breakfast. Um, oatmeal and skim milk, that's what he wanted for breakfast. But it happened that he ordered breakfast, at the and, and less than two seconds later, Christopher Guest called down. And wanted me to get, he decided it was time for the band to leave and I should pick up his bags and pick up everyone else's bags and take them to their bus. Um, so because I was working alone, I kind of have to do things in the order they come at me. 
So I got Nikki Six's right. breakfast, and by the time I had finished everything with that, it was only you know ten minutes tops. Uh, Christopher Guest had decided it had taken me too long to get upstairs, and in a huff, he had come down to the lobby uh, and told me that he left his bags outside his room, and I should just go get them. And he was very he was very disappointed with me. I, I made Christopher Guest sad. Apparently, I have read. Did he give you like a disappointed dad face or it, something? It kind of. It it wasn't really because he was legitimately angry, not not trying to like make me feel bad out of some sort of joke. Apparently, Christopher Guest, I have read, believes that since uh, since he is paid to be funny, he doesn't have to be funny when he's not being paid. Um, That's weird. I yeah. didn't know you could turn funny on and off. <laughs> yeah, apparently Christopher Guest can. Uh, so he was mad, and he actually complained. Uh, but the, the kicker of this is that I then went to go get his bags, and I knocked on Harry Shear's door just after. I knocked on Michael McKeon's door just after, and neither of them were ready. And it was an hour before either of them were ready to go. Um, so Christopher Guest so, was mad at yeah. me for making him late when the rest of the band wasn't ready to go for another hour after he was he, he wanted me there. Wow, it's it's borderline spinal tap. It was anyway. it was it was rather spinal tap esque. And in in fact, to that regard, um, as I picked up. Michael McKeon and Harry Shear's bags uh, together, and we all rode the elevator down together. Uh, they they spent about five minutes ruminating on organic orange juice. <laughs> what? <laughs> I don't know. It was it was a long conversation about organic orange juice. It was very weird. <laughs> That's wild. Yeah, they're great guys, but uh, Christopher Guest not as great. Well, you know, because he turned off his funny switch. He turned that off. We his all funny have. Switch. He turned off his funny in switch. our brain. Yes. For instance, for the, for this podcast, we mostly leave it off. Yeah, unfortunately. And now, now yeah, we, I don't even know where it is. I've just talked for uh, five minutes about something completely unrelated. All right. <laughs> Spinal Tap. Yes, about Spinal Tap. The film we watched. Yeah. See, here's the thing. I don't know what to talk about it because it's a comedy. Yeah. There's no... Unlike the other films we've watched, there's no... There's a comedic thrust to it, but there's not a moral thrust or anything like that that we're supposed to be queuing in on. There's no themes to talk about here, really. Right. It's like, I mean, other than the themes of, look at all these funny things that hair metal bands did and still do, even though they're washed up or don't. Yeah. hardly exist anymore it's well, this, it's kind of this is a problem makes I, it hard yeah this is a problem i was afraid we'd reach um with any movie we liked but fortunately fortunately we've been eh, i think the problem here is that we both like the movie and we're both very familiar with the movie already so there's nothing there's nothing new and interesting to talk about <laughs> right right and well and just in general i mean other than just talking about the jokes there's not a lot to talk about even if you it's the first time you've seen the film yeah you know what I mean? Like that's the problem with any comedy, I suppose. Is yeah, any comedy that's not trying to be more than a comedy, what it is. you can tell the jokes over again to each other and make each other yes. laugh again. You know, you can wander around at you know at school if you're in school the next day, like talking about how this thing goes to eleven or that thing goes to eleven. Yes, yeah. or classics. you know whatever. But in the end, you're kind of that's just the nature of comedy, I guess, right? Yeah. Well, yeah, the, the nature, uh, talking about the Eleven thing, uh, that that scene where, you know, all essentially the joke is that he just repeats, well, this it goes, goes to, to 11. 11. It goes to 11. That's his explanation for why it's better. It goes to 11. No definition of why 11 is better, but it goes right, to 11. It's one it point it better. Is, it, is, it is one one better. And and it just ruminates on that. It's such I mean, there's such a fine line between stupidity and cleverness. Well, right, point. and that's a hilarious scene. And Don't get me wrong. Yeah. It, but like, even like repeating it outside of the movie will sound stupid. Oh yeah, absolutely. 
You know, because it's a lot of the comedy in that is in the acting, you know, in yeah. the way he carries off just being totally incapable of comprehending that. Yeah. Ten oh, that is louder and one better than ten are the same thing. That is one thing about good comedy, especially comedic movies. Obviously, obviously, stand up, you can have a joke that, you know, follows a joke format. But, right. but pulling a quote out of a movie. And expecting it to be funny just on its surface, um, it's, it's always right, problematic. Right, unless, right, and honestly, a movie that has that element that you yeah. can pull jokes at is not a very good comedy. Yeah. Because it, in the end, it's, it's more like a stand-up performance, as you yeah. said. And those don't make for good comedy movies. They're not really good comedy movies. Yeah, because they're I not, mean, they're not narrative. They're right, not. the only ones you're gonna find that are, like, funny to, if you like pull quotes from movies, are only funny for the people who have seen the movie. Yeah, exactly. So, like, when, I guess we could just spend the rest of the film, this podcast, just talking about the nature of comedy if we want. Right. Or, <laughs> like, I guess we could just start telling scenes from the film and then like laughing to ourselves and then yeah. just have our. I well, assume our audience listened to it yeah, or, or not you know, listened to it, watched it, but that's that's certainly that's certainly they a thing, should though, really. Uh, the turning up to 11. If someone says that in public, that's, that's, that'll get a, that'll get a little snicker out of me because I'm thinking about the movie. Or, right, if someone, it has nothing to do with what they said, really. Or if someone they just says, keyed into a good moment. In if someone life. says, these cans, stay away from these cans, it's, I'm laughing because I'm thinking about the scene in The Jerk, not because I'm thinking about that line from The Jerk. That line isn't funny outside the context of that line. Right, exactly. You're, you're thinking about a moment in your life that was positive and yeah. that made you laugh. And yeah. it's, yeah, it's hard to deal with, like, this is, there's not a lot of pod, or comedy uh, films on the Criterion Collection. I think there's a reason for that. I mean, I do not think that, in any way, I do not believe, I, oh, man, it's hard to speak English. Um. I do not believe in any way that comedy is some sort of lesser form of art. Oh, yeah. It's just different, and it doesn't lend itself to critique in the same way that, like, a drama does. Oh, certainly. Certainly. Because you're going to be critiquing the humor. Yeah. I mean, I guess Spinal Tap does have a sort of moral thrust, if you want to get down to it. Like, like don't go, like, excess is, you know. Yeah going to be a problem no matter what the situation even if you're rich and yeah. famous or you yeah. know and also like if maybe sometimes it's just better to let it go <laughs> and there's there is certainly tragedy in this movie to an extent i mean it's obviously it's tragedy played for comedy but every every comedy you know com comedy traditionally is just a, an inversion of tragedy in a right. tragedy your your character climbs and climbs and climbs and then falls in in your in your traditional comedies your character goes through crap and garbage and, and eventually is redeemed. Um, <laughs> which, which to speak of in this film is actually a pretty great part, is the, the quote-unquote redemption at the end where they yes, reconcile. Yes, it's just yes. hilarious. I mean, I mean, it's a very well-written comedy. Oh, yeah. And it's, it's very well reflective of what they're, trying to, what they're trying to make fun of. Just that at the end, they're, uh, they're big in Japan. Um, well, and the just, weird thing about it, when you think about it, and I guess we, there is some stuff to talk about, is that that weird, like, fall and fall and fall and then redeem yourself at the end is both comedic but also alarmingly reflective of what happens to people in these situations. Oh, yeah. So, I guess it's one of those sort of, con like, art, or, uh, you know, like, it's it's one of those things where it, it's very reflective of the real nature of these kind of bands. Oh yeah, you're big in Japan, so you want to get back together kind of thing. And it's like, yeah, it's hilarious, but it's also 100% true. Yeah. Which when you think about it means that the real life is also hilarious. Like yeah. the real life like aspect that they're parodying, I uh, parrot, nah, I can't speak English. Parrot, I can't say period. I can't say it. Parodying. Yes, that's the word. There you go. Uh, is uh, you got to put those two I sounds in there. It's I can't hard. do it. Uh, I, well, I keep wanting to say parroting, not parody. Yeah. I can't. I still can't do it. Oh it's man, right. this is gonna be like. I'm not gonna say that word again. Just don't. Yeah, you, it's really hard. You pause whenever you want to say it, and I'll pause. Yeah, and you just like go, Adam. Go parodying. Oh, see, and you sound so smooth. I know, right?
You're, you have a much better radio <laughs> voice than I do. Actually, I got a better radio face, too. But I'm... Oh, hilarious. Ha-cha-cha! See, that's a joke. <laughs> and that's something you can... It's not a good joke. It's not a good joke. It's a joke you could just say. And yes, I'm not... I don't have to it, be Its comedic it elements anymore. are contained within itself, but... Yes, yes. Um, actually, this movie, this movie did, did make me think about something else that's happened this week. Uh, also at the hotel, and this is, this is closer to the current time, so I will get in more in trouble, uh, more in trouble oh, right. for, You're for mentioning totally this fired. one. Except um, for there's nobody listening, so, eh, who cares? Uh, this, uh, we're, we're recording this, uh, in, in the summer, so I hate to date it, but, but this is important for the context of the story. <laughs> Do you want to give the exact um, day and time, Adam? Well, last week, last week, uh, coming through town and all staying at my hotel was a tour called Summerland, um, in which, which I, I believe should probably have been called, Hey guys, uh, remember the, uh, remember the 90s, the tour? Uh, it so was, who playing? it was, uh, the Gin Blossoms, um, okay. Everclear, wow. Marcy's Playground, Lit, okay. and really? yes, and oh shoot, Marcy's Playground, Lit, Sugar Ray. See, here's the thing. I, you know what, I, you know, I may have heard about this tour at, a, yeah. at an outside source because somebody else is talking about how <laughs> th- they can't imagine there's anybody out there who needs to go to this tour. Oh, no one needs to go to this well, tour. No, this... What I mean is, is like, there are bands out there, right, that are a little washed up, that, like, have, like, a really hardcore fan base that still really loves them, right? Yeah. But Never like, clear, Everclear, I'm sure, is, is counted among do them. Do you think that's one of them? I, I think Everclear is. I think Gin Blossoms could be. I do I not see, think any of those other bands are. I guess that's just really hard for me to reconcile in my head. <laughs> yeah. Like, oh no, you don't think Sugar Ray has a has a hardcore following? Um, I'm guessing not... Icelandic teens. <laughs> Icelandic teens. Well, they're big in Iceland. This this is the go. sort of tour. This is the sort of tour that it is. I it's expect. Big in Japan. Too. I expect to be big in Japan. It's not the sort of tour that I expect to be big in in Columbus, Ohio. Actually, I I made a blog post about it, and I I suggested that perhaps the tour is sponsored by now. That's what I call Music Volume Two. Um. <laughs> I I did this on Tumblr, and someone reblogged it. A fan of Everclear, who's very much looking forward to their show in uh, Georgia for the stop on this tour, just called me an asshole for saying that. That's <laughs> well, here's the that's thing. what I got. I'm, I'm not afraid to admit. I believe I own an Everclear album. It does not change the fact that like it's really hard for me to believe that there are like people. There who, are people. Yeah, who are like you know they sit down and they're like. <laughs> Flip it through their music library on their iPod, and they're like, what am I going to listen to today? Ah, the old standby, Everclear. Yes, yes. It's weird, See, right? I will, I will occasionally pick up, I mean, if I hear it on the radio, I will enjoy listening to a Jim Blossom Of course. It's not, but that's it's what not I'm something, saying. That's I mean, totally they're, fine. They're very well-written pop songs. They really are. Um, and, you know, everybody's hits are, are well-enough-written pop songs. Let's, uh, Own Worst Enemy gets stuck in my head from time to time. Marcy's playing right. around Sex and Candy. But but that's like it. That's what I'm saying. Yeah. Is like you're talking the, about a lot of people who have a few songs that will get stuck yeah. in your head, and you're basically going yeah. to a concert for. Yeah, you're going like to a, a concert. A few songs that are stuck in your head. You're going to a concert to recreate an afternoon of '90s radio. Of, right, of, exactly. Of, what I used to listen to, yeah. like while I was cleaning my my bedroom yeah. or something like that. Or or what what played what played in the background as we as we stocked shelves at uh, at Coles or. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, that was mostly country music. Don't get me started. <laughs> but played but, played through the intercom system rather than the regular speaker system. One of one of the weird parts, and you know, kind of the nature of you know the the latest single got them big in Japan. So so they'll go and Japan will like that single, but is Japan going to like the rest of the songs? Well, who knows? But that but, but that but then again, when you're big in another yeah. country where they don't actually understand your song, yeah, it doesn't matter. It's not as relevant. It's like. Yeah. Literally, from personal experience here, you'll have one song that explodes, plays on the radio, and the song their their concerts will sell out with people yeah. having learned n- n- no other not, songs, nothing else, that plays just that song. But that's not important because uh, the Americans do the same thing. Yeah. Oh yeah, absolutely. I mean, like absolutely. everybody does the same thing. It's like, oh, I got to go listen to this. And it's like, well, I don't know any of the other songs, but they're all waiting for that one song. It doesn't play. matter. Exactly. And they exactly. bought their twenty, thirty dollar ticket for that. Well, with this Summerland tour, uh, when it was first introduced to me, 
uh, when I first heard about it a few months ago, uh, the premise, or at least how it was marketed, was that everyone would be playing their hits, and only their hits. So it's come hear the songs you know from us. That's weird. That's Which like, is that's, super that's weird, like... because that means Marcy's Playground plays one song, Lit plays one song, Sugar Ray plays three songs, Everclear plays like six, and you know Jim Blossoms play like five. Right, and that's, so it's Y105 on the radio yeah, on the bus yeah, while I was going to school every it's day. Literally, it is. yeah. It's, it's, it's For those of you who don't know, it's a mixed, radio station in Mansfield, Ohio, where we grew up. Mansfield, Ohio, yes. Sunny uh, Mansfield, where, I believe it's called. Where we went to high school. Where I went to high school. Where you semi grew up. Well, yeah, but my point is where I rode the bus. Yes, it is and where, where our teacher or where our bus driver made us listen to that same <laughs> station and play the same songs over and over again every day. Every hour. They repeat it oh, every hour. That is, that is one of the problems with American radio. But yes. <laughs> and you know, do you realize how far we've derailed? Oh, we, we have not derailed because this is a movie mocking the nature That's of true, popular music. So let's and just make fun are, of popular music for the next We are now hour. mocking the nature of popular music. Right, so we're um, doing what the film does, but yes, not as doing, well. <laughs> but not as well. And isn't that what really this is all about? Doing right. what Other professionals do, do not but as not well. as well? I think we do an excellent job, Adam. <laughs> no, it's true. It's true. Um, I did uh, one one fun story. It's the uh, the folk men. No, it's the something men. Anyway, uh, apparently, apparently on a Spinal Tap tour, the way that the band, the the folk group that that they do in uh, in a Mighty Wind came together, is that they got tired of playing Spinal Tap music, so they started opening for themselves. <laughs> as as this folk band, which is not not something anyone was expecting, and and apparently there were enough people who were there just because they were fans of the whole heavy metal thing uh, that that mocking folk bands in front of them really missed the audience. Um, wow, really? And I would got, not assume got, like, that that booed. would be the case. But. They got like booed. But yeah, yeah, it was it was people How who were not. How do you not... boo a parody band? That's what I want. Well, I I guess they didn't realize that it was, it was a, parody a parody band. band. They didn't That's realize that it was amazing. Christopher Guest, Michael McKeon, and Harry Shearer in different makeup. Um, that's well, I mean that's the story. That might be that's that might weird. be completely fabricated. That might be just what someone yeah. said on Wikipedia once. But uh, oh uh, yeah, well Wikipedia is a dangerous place. Yeah. But yeah, no, I, really like... I I can see it. But what I mean is, like, if you come to a concert for a band that you know is a parody band, how do yeah. you find yourself booing any band that plays for a parody band? <laughs> exactly. What exactly. I mean is, like, they are... <laughs> it doesn't matter if the other band that's playing for the parody band is a parody band or not. They're playing for a parody band. You just don't... Yeah. I don't see any human being having the right to boo a well, parody band. <laughs> I guess unless they're really bad at it. I'll give you this. Um... Once when I saw the Aquabats, a band that opened for them was called Downtown Brown. They're from Detroit. And promoters have a problem finding a band to play with the Aquabats because the Aquabats <laughs> are a funny band. They're, they're certainly a novelty band, <clears throat> but they're very, uh, they're very open in their audience. I mean, they have a kid show, for crying out loud. Um, right, right, yeah. They're unique in yeah. all the elements that word entails. Yeah, so when... When promoters are trying to find a local novelty style band to open for them, inevitably it's someone who's terrible and someone who is, whose comedy is entirely based on raunch, whereas the Aquabats comedy is based on this parody of children's television from the 70s. Um, <laughs> right. A, yeah. You don't see a lot of other bands doing that, so I, I assume it's very no, hard no. to find. So Downtown Brown, I, I hated because they weren't very good. Um, so that's that's one example of this. Yeah, they were bad at what one they were bad at what they do, and two they weren't they weren't in the style of funny I was expecting going to an Aquabat show. I, I mean, I um, guess I can see that with the with the Spinal Tap people. If you're expecting yeah. to see a a mock hair metal, metal performance, yeah. and you get Folk. A mock folk. <laughs> yeah. You're going to be confused. And what you have to assume, what you might even assume is a straight folk band. Right. But the issue I'm having with it is, is, like, I've never found myself 
booing an opening band. Oh, no. No, no matter I've how never, bad they are, because they're no the opening how. band. They're not supposed okay. to be as good as the real band. That's why they're another the opening Aqu- band. Another Aquabats experience uh, in Cincinnati, the, the opener who was like 20 minutes late going on because their uh, guitar player had to, no, their lead singer had to work. Uh, but when he finally got there, and clearly had just stepped out of a uh, restaurant job. He was he was dressed as a waiter when he got there. Um, he he walked in and uh, out of his bag that had his guitar uh, pulled out a uh, and you know this is a show at a bar, but it's still the Aquabat, so it's it's an all ages thing. Uh, he walked in and pulled out an eight inch long black rubber dildo and set it on top of the bass amp. Really? Yeah. Was that supposed um, to be funny? Apparently, that was that was a point of 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 humor to this band. They never called attention to it. Well, that could be kind of funny. They never made a joke if, about if it. If it weren't an all ages thing, where they're it was people... just, it was just weird that it was there. Right, right. I can uh-huh. kind of see that as a comedy thing if yeah. it's just never ever referenced after it's presented. That I mean, that's a that yeah. could be funny, but it's not. Yeah. Pro- it's not certainly not in style with but the Aquabats. Yeah, it's not it's not funny in and of itself. It's funny that this is a weird thing that happened and absolutely no one's commenting on it. That right, they're not trying right. to make more of a jo- if they tried to make more of a joke out of it, it would be bad. Right. But it's certainly not its high nature. brow and it's certainly not yeah, well it's, thought it's, out. It's, there could be there are other funnier things that he could have pulled out of his bag and left on the amp and never mentioned. Yeah. Yes. There are many things that are funny. There, there's literally nature. a universe of things. <laughs> For example, a, pewter busts of Abraham Lincoln. A wooden duck. Exactly. <laughs> we could we could we could spend a half hour naming things that are funny <laughs> by their nature right. than, a, than an eight inch long funny. rubber black dildo. Um, but Maybe that's what the I, rest I of the podcast should be. <laughs> no, no, we should probably get back to talking about Spinal Tap. Yeah, I, think so. I mean, we're still peripheral, but one thing I really loved about this movie, and we kind of we've kind of mentioned it, is not only is it a spot on parody of uh, of just the whole nature of the biz, um, the biz, uh, yeah, but it's a professional it, Adam. Individuals, individuals are parodies of of the sort of people you find in this sort of thing. Like the the manager, the manager who's not necessarily incompetent, but is is certainly trying to. Uh, <laughs> trying to not let the band know how bad off they are. Well, that's the thing is like he's one of those few characters in it that you actually kind of, I find myself actually relating to and feeling for. Oh, because I, I understand I definitely what feel his for. job is, and that it's basically impossible. He's yeah. trying to hide from a band that used to be huge, huge. That the they're fact not that they are anymore. not important, yeah. that they do not matter. And he, yeah. were, and he, uh, you really do feel some. Uh, I at least I do personally feel for him when he's going through. It and yeah. it's like really sugarcoating things for them. Oh yeah, in, 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 the, like, in the funniest way possible. But yeah, what, like when they find out there's not a Boston show, it's, it's Boston. Oh, it's not a not a big college town <laughs> yeah, anyway. We won't have a we won't have a crowd. Um, the limo driver who uh, who insists that Frank Sinatra is real music and. Uh, and rock and roll is just a fad, even though it's 1984. <laughs> right. Um, well, you know, yeah, yeah. Like, I, he's great. Well, I wasn't sure if he's talking about rock and roll or specifically hair metal. Maybe, maybe specifically hair metal. Because but, that but certainly still, was a fad. But. Still, his his cultural references to Frank Sinatra, who himself was a fad that had had died out 20 years prior. Um, if right. Not right. Yeah. You know. Um. Well, yeah. Uh, obviously all the band members are, are parodies. I really, there's, there's the great running gag about the drummers. Um, <laughs> yeah, and the yeah. payoff, the payoff on that isn't, I mean, it, it's unexpected. It, uh, they obviously very much foreshadow the payoff on the drummers story. I, I'd have, I'd have appreciated that joke better if it wasn't happening, if what happened to the current drummer wasn't something they'd established as having happened to a previous drummer. Yeah, yeah, they could have. Because, yeah, all of the other stories, bit. All of the other stories, the drummers disappeared or died in some mysterious or just weird circumstances, including one who spontaneously combusted, and then our our drummer here um, spontaneously combusted. And, you know, it's payoff for a joke because their explanation about why that drummer spontaneously combusted is that, you know, lots of people, it happens all the time and you just don't hear about it. So it happens yeah, twice. Yeah. It's, <laughs> it's, happens it's twice a cement- is right. cementation of that, of that joke. But has value, 
I would have preferred it's, it's, if it had been some other really just yeah. absurd <laughs> set so, of coincidences. Yeah. Uh, Impaled by a narwhal or something. Yeah, exactly. Something that, like, doesn't happen. Yeah. Like, because, yes. like, all the other ones, yeah, like, gardening accident and are just so absurd. Yeah. Like, why couldn't our latest drummer die in similar <laughs> circumstances? But Yes. I do, I, I do like how, how that explosion um, visually uh, immediately segues into the new drummer, uh, smoke clearing with the new drummer at the show in Japan. I think I really mm-hmm. like that shot. Uh, just from a narrative standpoint, that is that is one of the few things that our fake uh, documentary director got right. Um, <laughs> in, I guess. Yeah. Was was cutting it like that? Uh, but oh, there's so many great. I mean, obviously, there's a lot of great humor in this movie because it's a comedy done by people who are very good at comedy. Right. Um, yeah. And I mean, I guess we can hit like the major high notes. I, I yeah, that, guess is something we could do. Um, we got uh, know, the, the pods, the 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 concert with the pods. The yes. Concert, I mean, all of is, their all of their stage. Stuff, well, all of their just, stage. Stuff. I you know when I prefer some of the more subtle comedy. I guess. Yeah. But the the constantly shifting guitars that are featured, yes, and how absurd they are just in general, like yes. is is really kind of wonderful. Like, like I understand that these are all parodies of real guitars, but like somehow seeing yeah. them <laughs> constantly shifting between all of them is just for me yes. it was at least really rewarding. Oh, it's great. Like it's great. Yeah, yeah. It's and weird things like that. The. I'm trying to think of other examples, but Stonehenge, Stonehenge, yes, yes is great. And... Oh yeah, the uh, the miniature Stonehenge because they're all expecting it to be you yeah. know, lowered from the ceiling <laughs> yeah. and be like 18 feet tall, and they've got dwarves dancing around it for some reason, <laughs> right. and it's it's half the size of the dwarves. Um, <laughs> yeah, I mean, there's a lot of great... well, and just the entire Which, you know, is, playing is... at the uh, the army base scene. Yeah, it's just beautiful. I mean, that's that is kind of the t- the dwarves the dwarves with the. With the uh, with the Stonehenge is kind of the turning point for the band when they realize how bad off they are, or at least where they finally come to terms with how bad off they are. Obviously, there's hints that they're realizing it before then. Oh, uh, yeah. Well, the... that's one of the the nicer <clears throat> parts about the film is that they it's not just the manager Ian who's di- like yeah, hiding it every, from them. They are hiding it from themselves. Yeah, they're, they're hiding it. From all themselves. you can tell realize. Because there's pretty good acting in the film, you can you can see it in their eyes when things are going wrong. They know they're just yeah. completely washed. Oh, out they're all point. it's acted very well. They're all great actors, and they when they just, really pull off that sort of hidden yeah. awareness. Yeah, and that each exactly. one of them is almost hiding it from each other and themselves. Yeah, that it's over. But absolutely, no, you're absolutely right there. Um. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. It's just well acted. It's well acted for that. I mean, not beyond the comedic elements. There's some good. They're really good at relating the feelings of the characters as they go through these more and more failures. But yeah, I I I would. I have it in my notes because um, Kevin Smith has a tendency to use the number thirty-seven, and it it pops up a lot in movies um, because it's it's. I don't know. It's it's some sort of some conscious, universally recognized random number, thirty seven, and and it happens that thirty seven is the number of people who have been in the band total. Oh, was it? I remember it yes. being a large number. Yeah. Well, it's 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 that large, but not too large. Still funny, number, and not even. It can't be even, and it can't be a five. So it's got to be thirty seven. Right. Yeah. Yeah. No. It, it's, it's well. I mean, there's a, there's a very there's like a very psychological reason why 37 is a random number in this sort of thing. Well, but yeah, you but, see uh, it with any time you ask people to but, say a random number, they'll pick a certain set of numbers over and over and over again, saying they're random. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> so Kevin Smith uses that a lot. I don't know if he got it from, you know, obviously this is this is one reference to 37, so it's not like it's an overarching theme in the movie or anything. Um, but Kevin Smith uses it, and it shows up a lot. Uh, once you start thinking about thirty-seven, uh, you, you'll pick up on on how often it's used, and maybe it's selective in that I think I think it is a commonly used random number because I'm looking for thirty-seven now, um, and so I'm ignoring any any evidence otherwise. But 
<laughs> it does show up a lot. And it was nice to see that it showed up in here, I guess. Right. Uh, yeah. <laughs> oh, I just thought of one scene I really love. When, uh, when David is doing his guitar solo and leans back and leans back and leans back <laughs> he has and to he's eventually on the floor the and then the roadie comes down. Well, that's, a, that's one of those really up. subtle ones is the stagehand. Yeah. He's just one of my favorite oh, yeah. characters. We never talk oh, to him. Yeah. We never interview him, but he's one of my favorite characters. He's, yeah. he's ever he's, present and always doing the most ridiculous jobs. Like when he's blow torching the pod to get it open. Yes. It's just beautiful because yes. it doesn't make any sense. And I love how the audience generally, like, ignores it. Like, if I was at a concert and something like that happened, I feel like I would, I don't know, maybe, maybe, I mean, by nature, the stagehand is supposed to be ignored because he's not part of the band. I mean, the roadies, the roadies traditionally get, get the, uh, the second hand, uh, sex from all of the, all of the groupies, but, but, uh. This the stagehands, you know, during the concert, they're not a focus, so they can do anything. I guess is kind of, kind of what we're getting at. <laughs> right, right. They what do he a does really because great he does do anything. He's not just, he's not just walking out and he's not just walking out and handing people guitars. <laughs> well, he literally you know. spins him around <laughs> yes. and then stands him back up, and then he takes applause. And it's like, well, wait a minute. Yes. He didn't do any of those things, but because the <laughs> yes. because the stagehand is invisible. Yeah. yeah, I mean, it, exactly. it's a good parody exactly. of a kind of a different element from this. Than, I mean, most of it is focused on, most of the movie is focused on parodying hair metal bands, but yeah. it also does get into parodying just general live performance and yeah. other issues that are like, you know, secondary to hair yes. metal. And themed, themed weight staff. Themed weight staff is a very odd thing that they parody <laughs> right, in this right. movie for no but really reason. Really funny, so... Yeah, at that opening, uh, who's that? That's Billy Crystal. Is is it Dana Carvey? Is the other one? I think it's. I don't remember. It very well might be. It's somebody. It's somebody else from from. I mean, obviously, a very young comedian in 1984. But is Billy Crystal plays his boss and says eh, tells him to get back to work because mime is money because their waiters dress as mime. So it's hilarious. It's, it's a very Billy Crystal joke. Mime is money. <laughs> right. It's one of the. It's but one it's of the. Still, few it's still hilarious in context. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. It's it's one of the few standalone jokes. I mean, you still have to establish that they're mimes, but right. But that could be that could be a New Yorker comic. That could be a New Yorker right, comic. Right. Exactly. Script. And that that makes it standalone because I mean, yes. you can't say it goes to eleven and have people laugh. Yeah. Because it's not. It doesn't stand but, alone. It doesn't mean anything. No, I, 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 it's rare that you find a New Yorker comic that can just make someone laugh by looking. At it. <laughs> well, that's why I don't read the New Yorker, Adam. Well, I do because I'm a pretentious jerk. Mm. Well, they already know that. The audience. Well, I went to college for English. I have to, you know. Right. It's, it's that or McSweeney's, I guess. <laughs> but. Yeah. Well, you know, I went to you. <laughs> I went to my master's degree for English, and I'm proud to say I do not read the New Yorker. Well, you're a good man. You know, it's not for not. It's not. It's actually I want to, but come on, where am I going to get it? <laughs> you are in Japan. You could probably have it emailed to you or something. <laughs> like, like airlifted to Japan? Pay like four hundred dollars <laughs> yes. an issue. Oh yeah. You've got plenty of money. Right? Oh right, I'm loaded. Well, wow, we are yeah. totally off topic. So No, it, no come on. Talking still, about I agree in New Yorker no. comics is not. That's fine. It's fine. It's fine. It's fine. It's fine. The audience is asleep at the wheel anyway, by now. I assume they're all driving to work and all just passed out. Watch oh, out, there's a car! One, one more great, great little joke uh, that doesn't require much much context is that they were the band that they were originally in uh, called the originals, and then they found oh, out that yeah, they yeah, already great. called the originals, so they had to they had to change their name to the new originals, and then the other band changed their name. So they thought about going back to the originals, but then they didn't want to be confused, so they kept the new originals even though they didn't need to. <laughs> yeah, the 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 history of the of, yes, of the, the band of the is band. really well, and just watching them go through the eras is a lot of fun in general. It's yeah. one of the like yeah, more kind of just purely fun elements of it, because I mean the yeah. rest of it is literally a parody. But you that is not really a parody, like because you don't really see that in hair metal bands that much. 
<laughs> well, yeah, that's that's so. one of the more unnatural elements of the movie but is that they started yeah. off as this sort of Beatle, this sort of, this really 1966 Beatles sort of stand up suits, tight trousers, uh, rock band, um, pop band, and then they uh, they became this hair metal band, and then at the same time, well, and they uh, even go through a, a hippie stage, and yeah. yeah, yeah, they had a hippie stage. It was very it was Beatles esque to a point there, <laughs> obviously as well. And then, and then Derek, uh, when when everything's falling apart, he's got his own freeform jazz thing that he wants them to start <laughs> yeah, right, doing. Right. <laughs> Which I love that they still do dressed as just as their normal uh, their normal uh, Spinal Tap selves. <laughs> yeah, it, it's because it's not. Yeah, it's a weird weird thing. Uh, but such a great movie. yeah, it is. And, a lot and, of, and my point is just that like they do. One of the nicer elements of the film is that they do take departures from straight parody. That makes oh, yeah. it more fun oh, yeah. to watch because a straight parody that is pure parody that has no we did this just because we thought it'd be fun elements is not actually as much fun to watch. I mean, this one oh, yeah. has elements where they just threw it in because check out this funny thing I thought of. Well, yeah. If you tie yourself too much to what you're parodying, if you do a point for point mockery, Eventually, it gets tiresome. Yeah, and they, they do a really so, good job of so mixing gotta, it up with things like the mime yeah. jokes and yeah, yeah. The, the the history oh, of the band and yeah stuff that doesn't necessarily play out to a reality of a hair band. I don't I don't think anybody in Motley Crue used to be in a uh, yeah in a Beatles esque uh, yeah. suit rock pop band. Yes, with mop cuts well, and all that, with mop cuts and everything, and, and Ed Bagley Jr. on drums. <laughs> Ah, oh, such a, a lot of great little cameos in this movie too. Little people, yeah, joining in. Um, yeah, uh, I don't know if I have anything else you to know, say I don't... except to say that this is this is a wonderful movie. Um, I can understand not liking it because it is it is a little out there. Um, I'm certainly I could. Well, I, uh, I'm sure we could find. I'm sure we could find people who don't. Well, like to this talk movie. to you it, um, like straight up, like I was not a huge fan of it the first time I watched it. I did not really yeah. find it that funny. And and what, why is I that? don't know. I think it's because... <laughs> because what? No, it's because it is weird. Yeah. And you have to be in the right mindset to enjoy it. But I think it goes that way for all of their comedies. Think, just like with Best in Show. Like, yeah. I know a lot of people who do not like that film. In fact, I well, watched it with people who did not like it. Here's here's what I'll, what I'll say. I think that... Um, for their sort of mockumentary, you have to have at least a basic knowledge, if not an appreciation, of what they're trying to mock. Yeah, I think that's definitely so, true. So, Best in, Show, Best in Show has a lot of great non sequiturs, uh, particularly from Fred Willard's character, and that's, I think that's one reason I, I really like it. Um, but I guess if, if you're not at least peripherally familiar with the idea of a dog show, in as much as, you know, you know and, and obviously I'm not, and I still enjoy the movie. Um, but this, you've got to, you've got to know what they're mocking in order to understand why it's funny that they're mocking. Yeah. It. So, I mean, even without being interested in hair metal, um, I think, I think especially you now and, and, and me now, and I guess we're better informed we about under, the topic in general than we were. Yeah, not just, uh, but but with that. with the pretentiousness of of musicians in general. Yeah, I and, guess that's true. We're a little bit more aware the, of that. Yeah, yeah, than we were in high school. Yeah, I mean, but but I did I did like this movie even then because it's it's funny enough on its own. And Best in Show has a lot, even if you don't know. I guess I'm undermining my own point right now, but even if you don't know dog shows, um, or or just. But I think I think what's funny to me about Best in Show is just the obsession of people, right? right. And I know people and who you get, can translate get completely that over obsessed to with, any topic, really. Yeah. Well, yeah. and then I guess what um, really made Spinal Tap click more is not the the sort of the music industry and my knowledge of that, but my knowledge of the way that has grown since in the time in the intervening time yeah. of how self what's the word I'm looking for how unaware of self people can be as far yeah. as like their yeah. own importance and exactly and that's, that's, that's what the very movie is about movie. is people who yeah. are not aware of actually how important they are in the grand scheme of things yeah or how unimportant well, right, they right. Are I mean, in the grand scheme of things rather 
but but who hold on to any evidence to the contrary that 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 hold well, on yeah, to the because fact you that they're big in the they're big you, in Japan. Well, and you also hear it throughout the movie every time somebody degrades them they're like oh a bunch of wankers or something like that the response yeah, is yeah. just to dismiss the person when the person is just saying what everybody says about and yeah. it, it but i mean i guess that's what makes it play is i guess as you get what i'm saying is this is probably not a movie intended for people of junior high school and high school maturity. It's probably meant for adults <laughs> no. who have had a, a, enough life experience to build up an understanding of how people yeah. actually behave yeah. as it regards well, themselves. That's ultimately, ultimately, every Christopher Guest movie isn't necessarily a mockumentary of, of what the topic of the movie is, but it is, it is a movie parodying people. Right. Some element general. of humanity. Yeah. Personalities. Yeah. Personalities. And um, in this movie, it's it's not being self aware. In um, you know, in 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 the same way, and the music music business lends itself to this. Uh, a mighty wind is about holding on to the past in a way. Um, uh, uh, best in show, obviously, very much obsession with. Which with, is obsession. You know, things that general people don't care about. Yeah, I mean, it's basically about. obsession. Dog shows. Yeah. Because any it's any obsession you take obsession. that far is going to go beyond what normal people care about. Yes, yes, exactly. But the guy knows how to write a movie, even if he doesn't like to be nice in person. Right. <laughs> and that's really disappointing in the end. That Yeah. Because you, you want to believe somebody that's funny will be nice. But, nah. Yeah. And, you know, maybe I caught him yeah, that day, so, you know, it's completely understandable. Um... It's just, it's always funny to me thinking back that, that he got mad at me when, <laughs> when the we still took an band. hour for the band to get ready. I knocked, yeah, yeah, I knocked on their doors and like, oh, I'm not ready yet. Can you come back in 15 minutes? I came back, in, I came back four times to Harry's door, I swear. <laughs> but yeah, it was a great, it was a great morning. It was really nice meeting them all. Yeah, I'm glad you did. Even though, you know, it's not like I got to have a conversation with any of them, but, but. I rarely do. In fact, in fact, I can only think of one really extended conversation I had with anyone, and that was Frank Black of uh, the Pixies. I accidentally told him about my uh, my fake art rock band for like ten minutes <laughs> before I realized what I was doing. Right, that you were being that guy. <laughs> that I was. Oh man, I don't have a I don't have a demo disc. I can't. <laughs> it was, well, I, I wished him luck at the show, and I was very excited that we had booked a show that night. It was like the first one in a year and a half, so. So I said, I'm, not, I'm pretty excited myself. I got a show tonight. And then I started explaining the band. And then I realized that Frank Black is smoking a cigarette standing behind his bus while I put his bags onto his bus. He doesn't care about my band. Right. So I kind of cut myself short and said, you know, I'm just excited. And he nodded. And we didn't talk again. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah. Anyway. I have a lot of mediocre encounters with semi-celebrities and actual celebrities, and someday I'll be able to talk about them. <laughs> I think you just have, Adam. Oh, no, no. Not not technically speaking. None of this happened. Right, right. We're just going to edit out. This, this podcast is going to be eight minutes long. <laughs> it's actually going to be eight minutes long. Because we're, no. So if you're listening we're to not this going to do that, but and it was only eight minutes long, <laughs> there's you a You know secret. that I got fired or threatened to be fired. <laughs> No, uh, I uh, I'm working on the assumption that no one I work with ever ever uh, find who will actually this. listen to this um, will care, uh, and that's probably a very good assumption. They actually just added this uh, to the handbook within the last six months um, that we're not allowed to talk about the job on on social media, and that's a really dumb rule. And I don't think I ever signed that handbook, so. Do you usually have to sign here? I'm going to run with it. Well, I mean, it's 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 essentially my employment contract. Oh, okay. Is is the code of con? It's a code of conduct. I was going to say, like, not, usually not handbooks handbook. you hold on to, not. Sign well, I sign I in. sign one copy to accept that I I read it and understand it, but I don't know if I ever actually did it this time. So hopefully I didn't. So I won't be fired. But you know what? No one's going to fire me anyway. Because I quit. No, no, the whole place would fall apart without me. <laughs> All right, so speaking of self-importance, all right. 
as a theme. Hooray! All right. Well, I think that's pretty. I think we pretty much covered everything that we have to say yeah. about uh, this is Spinal Tap. It's a great movie. Yeah, this is. It's a we great did. movie. It's a fun movie. Hopefully, we Watch had a it. had a fun conversation this time around. I think so. Watch it if you haven't seen it. Watch it again if you have seen yeah, it. Definitely, um, if, if you do you'll not have... like it, at least give it one more try. Yeah. And if you watch it every day, uh, telling you to watch it again won't uh, won't change your plans. But so go please ahead. go outside once in a while if you watch it every day. Yeah, I mean, yeah, it's Batman just opened um, six months ago. <laughs> yeah, whenever you're watching this, <laughs> so uh, sometime yeah. before now. Uh, yeah, well, I mean, but if I just say Batman just listening. opened, more than likely, there will more be than a Batman likely, a Batman that movie. Yeah, that's yeah, true. Probably some sort of Batman. Um, I'm sure. I'm sure. By the time this actually goes live, Nolan's Batman will be old hat, and someone else you will be interpreting. I the hope character. it'll be a reinterpretation of the Adam West version of Batman. That oh, yeah. beautiful. actually, on on that note, a lot of local theaters, AMC especially, were planning on showing uh, marathons starting at like 6 p.m. They'd show Batman Begins, and then they'd show The Dark Knight, and then The Dark Knight Rises at midnight Thursday night. Um, my local theater right down the block, this little single screen independent, um, was playing Adam West's Batman movie uh, at 10 o'clock to segue into The Dark Knight Rises at midnight. That's and wonderful. It was wonderful, and I'm very disappointed that I had to work on Friday because I would have, I would have definitely been there. Anyway, thank you for listening this week. Sorry we got so distracted by Batman at the end there. Um <laughs> Next time we'll be talking about another American and another uh, movie and another another sort of weird one for the list because it is not necessarily a horror movie but a psychological thriller. That and, I find and that, psychological thriller definitely yeah. goes in air quotes. I think. <laughs> okay. Okay. Well, Pat has some negative yeah, feelings. We'll, we'll talk be talking about, about uh, Silence of the Lambs next time around. Join us for Boston Criteria with Adam and Pat. Talk to you later. Thanks Bye. for listening.